Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 745. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, for the time being. Got the keys to the new place, although we haven't moved in yet. We're extremely uh, optimistic and excited about moving over there and uh, having a new studio, a larger space where we can have in-person courses, among other things. Um, so we'll we'll have to pack up all the books and bring them with us. Um, the books behind me in the video here that some people often think is a, a fake Zoom background. <laughs> Somebody even asked me that. I'll introduce our guest here. It's Lane. But uh, it, it, somebody Gosh. even asked me if it was a fake background. I went back and grabbed a book <laughs> off of it and brought it with me too. And then they they still asked, so, so is it fake? And I was like, <laughs> that's a pretty pretty amazing fake background if uh, I could pull books off the fake shelf and, <laughs> and carry them around. This is some sort of metaverse I'm living in. Anyway, you're hearing uh, Lane Tipton, of course, who serves as pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania, as well as a fellow of biblical and systematic theology here at Reformed Forum. Welcome, Lane. It's good to see you today. Thanks, Camden. It's a delight to be here. We are today going to be speaking about Van Til's Doctrine of Revelation, uh, introducing a new course that Lane has taught. Uh, incidentally, just in a couple of weeks, Lane's going to be back in the studio to record the fourth course in our Fellowship and Reformed Apologetics on Common Grace and the Antithesis. But uh, we haven't even released uh, the third course yet. It just takes some time to edit them. I finished my job as uh, editing them. Uh, They're off now to be segmented and then incorporated into our online learning platform, uh, Reformed Academy, which is all available online. Everything we do, all the courses are there for free at reformedforum.org slash academy if you'd like to see them. And uh, we need to integrate them into the platform. We are going to add quizzes, um, you know, suggested reading, all that sort of stuff so that you as a student at home or in a study group can follow along. And we're also, just in a week, going to be starting a, another cohort. So just to give people a heads up, we've had three courses, well, two courses and two cohorts already, Introduction to the Theology and Apologetics of Cornelius Van Til, Book to Come, that's in the works, getting, going to get typeset. We have Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. Uh, that book is with the printer. It's being printed right now. Hopefully we'll be out by the end of the summer. And then this third course, Doctrine of Revelation, uh, which is going to be available very soon. If it's not available by the time you listen to this, it'll be available very, very quickly right away. So subscribe to the email newsletter for up-to-date information on this. But overall, Lane, how do you think uh, things have progressed now? We've done three courses. You're finishing up developing the fourth. You're going to be in studio to record, we hope, in the new place. Uh, so um we're going to be outside the confines. You'll be able to move around a little bit more freely. Might even be able to kick your leg like you used to do in a classroom. <laughs> How well, have my things been? My chiropractor told me to stop kicking. He said, that's not. Oh, he not told good. you to cut it out. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, I'll, I'll do the adjustments. You just uh, stop kicking. That hurts your back. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, I, might, I might do it anyway. If, if I, for, if I, it's just good. an old habit. The old students will know what we're talking about. Lane's, yeah. Lane's uh, idiosyncratic movements in the classroom, but whatever we can capture on film would be useful for posterity's sake. But, um, you know, having done three courses in this curriculum, four courses overall, you also taught a course on Union with Christ, which is available. And mm-hmm. uh, again, yeah. a book to come on that as well. Uh, um, you know, we've been learning things. I think we've, even from the very first course, oh, and you taught the one in Wimberley. So this you've done five. Um, oh, goodness. We're, we're moving right along. We, so we? we've done them in multiple locations, multiple subjects. Um I, for, I, for one, am very encouraged by what's going on here at, at uh, Reformed Forum, particularly in our global theological education. But it's interesting to see, and as we learn and become more efficient in our in our filming and editing and production, um, it's wonderful just to be able to continue to deliver these courses and then put them out for free. Like we're not, we don't charge any money for this. If you want it, and it's top tier material, so. I don't know. I, I'm 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 surprised, but I shouldn't be surprised. Um, but I'm I'm encouraged by the way that uh, the, these have been received and uh, by the the feedback we get from people all around the world. I, I presume you are as well. I'm thrilled. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things I think I enjoy the most about it, um, without reference to the expanded facility where live students might be mm-hmm. present. That 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 delights to me. But what I've enjoyed, especially about these Van modules 
is that in other contexts, I would teach the same courses over and over again. So I would teach a general theology of Van Til, for instance, and every time I taught it, it was the same course. What we're doing with Reformed Academy in terms of the Van Til modules is that we're developing an organic and progressive argument yeah. that begins with an overview, moves to Van Til's doctrine of God and creation and covenant and uh, into common grace, his doctrine of revelation, which we just did as a function of his doctrine of Trinity, creation and covenant. So I'm really enjoying the development of his, uh, a, a kind of systematic development of his thought in these lectures that can turn into uh, published volumes that accompany the lectures and really kind of probe Van Til at a depth and in a systematic way that he hasn't been probed before in no. lecture or written form. So well, we even exciting. think about the curriculum at Westminster where you used to teach. Uh, you, you'd end up coming in, for at least in the MDiv curriculum, you have two basic apologetics courses. AP 101 is kind of like an intro, but you, you've got people in there that are just learning what apologetics, the word means, all the way up to people that have read quite a bit of all sorts of material, not just Van Til, but all sorts of philosophy. You might have philosophy majors, maybe even people with a master's of, uh, master's in arts in, a, in a philosophy. So, you know, by nature of the student body and whatnot, you have to cover a lot of bases. And then you'd end up with AP 213, which is getting into more principles of apologetics and a little bit more detailed work uh, of Van Til. But even there, you're still covering a lot of some basic uh, philosophical things. They're not basic in the sense of like everyone should know this stuff just by virtue of being an adult. I mean, they're, they're still advanced topics, but in terms of developing apologetics, you're you're still being introduced to things like Immanuel uh, Kant's phenomenal noumenal distinction, like things like that. It's still rather introductory. But then even the seminars at, at Westminster, you taught the the uh, most thorough and theologically based uh, course uh, beyond the MDiv, which was Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. That has been augmented and, and altered, and that's available for free, the whole thing, through Reformed Academy, a better version of it. And then the book is coming out as a, a much more advanced and developed version of your dissertation. So that's available there. But the other seminars that were offered by Bill Edgar or, or Scott Oliphant or people before them um, are typically seminars. Uh, I can't recall taking a course uh, at the PhD level other than the one you taught that was actually lecture-based. Um, and so there's value in that. But to have a an ongoing series that continues to build on all the steps before it. Uh, I hesitate to say, but a blockhouse method? No, it's not, it's not a blockhouse method. Uh, the Vantillians will know what we're talking about there. But a compelling, ongoing, unfolding development, whereas each course kind of presumes some familiarity with, and a, a, we hope, even a mastery of the preceding material. It's just, it it it, it constantly grows in, in, in its force, in its momentum, I should say. And yeah. uh, it's really something unusual that we can't, this is not a replacement for a seminary education. It's not designed to be that, but it's something we're, we're seeing uh, what, is, what is afforded by this new technology and this new delivery system in a way that you couldn't necessarily expect to fit into an MDiv. So it's not a replacement for the MDiv. It's, it's tangential, it's orthogonal, whatever word you want to use. Nevertheless, it, it, it has weaknesses uh, if you're trying to replace an MDiv with this type of thing. That's dangerous, I think. But for a lifelong learner, somebody wanting to develop in, in this theology or someone wanting to augment uh, a previous theological education, there's things in this, in this type of approach you can't accomplish um, in a traditional model. Yeah, that, that's true, Camden. Um I like to use, and we've joked around about this, like to use Voss's progressive organic model yeah. for the relationship among the modules right. that each one assumes what was done in the last installment, but then organically advances it and applies it to topics that have yet to be explored. And I love this. I'll give a concrete example. I think I recall doing this in the previous lecture. Um, I said, if you're curious about what 
autothean personhood means. Link back to the previous module where we right. discussed that extensively. Right. And in a different context, say when I was at Westminster Seminary, you just couldn't do that because there was no antecedent course to which you could appeal. You were teaching the same thing over and over again. So this organic progressive development of Van Til's theology has been a real delight for me. And I'm so thankful for the delivery system and for the idea of this Reformed Academy and offering Van Til in this way. I think it holds forth the opportunity of opening up theological vistas for people that otherwise would be forever closed. Sure. So all the recordings, all the courses are available for free. If you can get online, you can get them just through the web browser. You sign up for a free account and you can access all the videos, all the courses that we've produced through Reformed Academy. Uh, now, those are on demand, but for anyone who would like to go further and have a conversation, interact with Lane, uh, interact with other students, uh, be available for um, you know offline or online events that are off scheduled time, if you're interested in that sort of thing, we do have cohorts that are available. So I think we're we're sold out. We might we might have a space or two left. So if there if someone's listening to this right on April eighth, I suppose when this comes out, it'll be a week after the the cohort begins. Um, but I suspect that we're all we're all out. But we will have we're planning to have a cohort for the fourth course on common grace and the antithesis. We do offer those. Now those there is a registration fee for the cohorts. Uh, because Lane is available twice a week, you know, to two cohorts, once a week each, uh, for an hour, for a scheduled time of of uh, further discussion, questions and answers relative to the lectures in the course. So that that is a learning environment. We do charge for that because it is not a scalable thing, and um, requires a lot of labor and effort, not just from Lane but from uh, administrative uh, staff and other and other type things. So. That's there and available. And then down the road, we hope to be opening some of these courses for people to attend in person. And uh, while we film them for the web to make free for the web, people can sit in the lectures. And then after the lecture, obviously participate in times of discussion and questions and answers. So this is kind of what we're up to here at Reformed Forum uh, in terms of our educational efforts. In addition to that, we have all of our publishing which is supportive of the education. We have, we're planning to have books for each of these courses and then books that don't have courses, you know, other books and resources as well. Our events, uh, you start to see all the different activities that we're into here at Reformed Forum. So that's a bit of an update on what we're doing here and uh, obviously can use your, your support. Um, we definitely need it. Uh, we have a, a, a big ambitious uh, set of projects that we would like to get to. Um, but we do need the support of all of our listeners and viewers to help us to produce and distribute all of these resources and to make them free, all the podcasts, all the courses, but obviously it's not free to make them. Uh, but we rely on the support of, of our donors to help with that. So before we get into some of the sm more specific uh, Doctrine of Revelation material, specifically on Thomas Aquinas, maybe Karl Barth and Van Til, I would like to make a very uh, uh, strong appeal and encouraging appeal uh, to head on over to reformedforum.org slash donate to pledge your support. We really, really need uh, sustaining supporters, especially monthly givers. Uh, if you uh, commit to a monthly gift, even a 5 or $10 a month, it goes a long, long way. So if you benefit from any of these resources, remember that your gift is going toward making these available for people around the world. So you're benefiting. We'd like to have uh, you support us so that we can continue to provide you resources. But your gift... Uh, gets multiplied in a variety of ways to make these resources available all over the world. And we get them translated into Spanish, Chinese, and we're looking at other languages where we have connections with people in foreign mission fields. Please, 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 I encourage you to, to give if, uh, if you have the means and you have the interest. Um, and one more little benefit. Uh, we do have a private Discord server uh, where we have uh, chats and stuff throughout the week. Uh, we're, we're also going to be hosting private events inside the server. So if you'd like to discuss or talk about theology with a like-minded group of people, we do make that available to our donors. So if you are a donor to Reformed Forum, we'll give you an invitation to our Discord server and uh, encourage you to uh, to do that. It's a wonderful place. It's really starting to pick up. We get a lot of book discussions in there, comments, questions, all sorts of good stuff. And I keep an eye on that Discord app uh, 
you know, throughout the day. I know Lane, you're in there here and there as well. And uh, it's, it's a great time to converse and uh, chat about important things. Well, with that, Lane, I got a couple of thoughts on this Doctrine of Revelation stuff. I think this is such a timely course. It always has been, but there's, all, you know, from time immemorial. <laughs> Ever since Van Til wrote, there have been people that said, you know, Van Til denies natural theology. Van Til denies natural revelation, maybe even. Or Van Til says unbelievers don't know anything. Um there are, there are a lot of misunderstandings about Van Til and misinterpretations of what he said and what he meant in a specific context. Uh, there's a distinction between uh, psychological and epistemological knowledge for him in terms of what a believer says he knows and what a believer or what, what an unbeliever says he knows and what an unbeliever can account for according to his own philosophy and what he actually knows as being made in the image of God. There's that difference, but. My goodness, it seems like it doesn't matter how much time and effort we can we can devote to teaching and speaking about this, but there's there's always a lot of criticism regarding Van Til on natural theology. Of course, the article Nature and Scripture in the Infallible Word is essential reading on this matter, but much of this has been brought back to the fore because of the publication of Voss's book Natural Theology, which um I believe, I don't know if it was ever published uh, uh, before this, uh, a very kind of early manuscript, but now we have a, an English translation published, and it has a rather lengthy introduction by our brother in the OPC, uh, Reverend John Fesco, Dr. John Fesco. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Fesco doesn't doesn't uh, have the same, uh, you know, appreciation of Van Til that we have, and is trying, seeking to point out a variety of of issues with Van Til and Voss and, and Thomas Aquinas, particularly how they interpret Thomas Aquinas. So I wanted to give you the opportunity, Lane, at least to, to speak about uh, Thomas Aquinas and his doctrine of the natural knowledge of God, maybe give us a little bit of an intro into what Van Til thought about that, and then we're going to include a full lecture from this new course where Lane describes this and, and speaks about everything from soup to nuts. Uh, the whole course is a is a developed argument in this way. So you're only going to get a segment of it, but we will include about a 25-minute section from this course so you can get a feel uh, for what's going on in this course on the Doctrine of Revelation. But Lane, just to, just to give you, you know, pass the mic over to you in a sense, um, what, what do you think accounts for uh, this Van Til... Uh, supposed hatred of Thomas, or even even worse, I suppose, uh, the the supposed Va Vantillian misrepresentation of Thomas's views on the natural knowledge of God. Yeah, um, it's. Uh, I, I think that often when people probe Vantill for his own view of the natural knowledge of God, there's been so much work done that misrepresents him on natural theology, natural revelation, and the natural knowledge of God, that people come to him and understand him to be, in effect, denying the possibility of natural revelation, natural theology altogether. There are some who would understand him to be either an idealist or a bardian. And Thomas, on the other hand, who affirmed uh, a form of natural theology seems like the only reasonable alternative to these people like Van Til and Bart and others who, uh, you know, Van Til allegedly denies natural revelation, uh, denies natural theology, denies the possibility of attaining the natural knowledge of God. And so in this module, what we tried to do is situate Van Til and Aquinas, and let them speak on their own terms, uh, assess their arguments on the basis of their own published works, and focused narrowly on the question of the natural knowledge of God. If you take Adam from the dust of the earth in the Garden of Eden, formed as the image of God, which both uh, Van Til and Aquinas affirm, um, what would what would each say about the image of God and the natural knowledge of God? And here's a mini thesis, Camden. I, I think this is useful, especially when you read Voss's natural theology. 
Remember that Voss in uh, volume two of his Reform Dogmatics, when he discusses the image of God, he says there are distinct and irreconcilable conceptions of the natural image of God, the created image of God, when it comes to, to, to traditional Roman Catholicism, represented by Aquinas, Bellarmine, Trent, on the one side, and what Voss calls the traditional Reformed or deeper Protestant conception of the image of God on the other side. And so as, as we approach this question of natural revelation, natural theology, and natural knowledge of God, the miniature thesis that kind of lies in back of the presentation of this section of the, the module is that what you believe about the nature of the image of God is going to determine internally what you believe about the nature of the natural knowledge of God mm -hmm. and the nature of natural revelation itself. Right. And um, I noticed this, I'm not here to do a review of it, but I noticed, for instance, in Fesco's uh, forward to the Voss volume, that connection, you know, reading Voss organically and looking at image of God and the bearing of that on the view of natural revelation wasn't even addressed. But this course takes that as a kind of integral foundational starting point. What do the traditional Roman Catholics like Thomas uh, believe about the image of God and natural knowledge? What do the traditional Reformed following Calvin, and Voss, and others, what did they say about the image of God and natural knowledge of God? And when you frame it that way, Camden, I haven't said what it is yet, but when you frame it that way, it really uh, affords an opportunity to recognize a second mini thesis that there are actually varieties, distinct varieties, distinct conceptions of natural theology, mm -hmm. of natural knowledge of God. There's a distinctive traditional Roman Catholic variety. There's a distinctive traditional Reformed variety represented by Calvin and others. And so as we approach the issue here, getting primary source familiarity, recognizing fundamental differences on image of God, opens us up to see that there really are varieties or kinds um, incompatible at foundational in foundational ways, there are kinds of natural theology. There's a Roman Catholic, traditional Roman Catholic variety. There's a traditional Reformed variety. And when Van Til's criticizing Thomas, the easiest way I know how to put it is he's saying Thomas doesn't represent the Reformed Calvinist confessional view of the image of God, natural knowledge of God, and natural revelation, natural theology, he represents the traditional Roman Catholic kind, mm -hmm. and it's rooted in, in these differences on image, nature, and natural knowledge of God. Yeah, that's a great point. It uh, probably should go without saying, but it doesn't. There is no univocal or uniform natural theology. Uh, it, there just isn't. Uh, there's all sorts of different varieties, but these basic presuppositions on theological anthropology, these basic theological differences have to be remembered and situated at every point. There are fundamental, you know, this architectonic, that's a good word. I'm going to use your yeah. word. There are architectonic <laughs> differences between Roman Catholic and Reformed uh, theology here on anthropology. Huge differences on the image of God, what it is. There's even big differences between Reformed and Lutheran theology on that subject. That's right. But we're, we're also speaking about the noetic effects of sin, how sin affects our minds and our hearts, our wills, etc. Um, but what I found is that often people that are entertaining and very optimistic and enthusiastic about the theology and philosophy of Thomas Aquinas from the Reformed perspective, the typically uh, looking at aspects of Thomas's theology divorced from or somehow segmented from some of these more basic presuppositions, not just the starting point in terms of uh, image of God and anthropology, what man is, you know, Thomas is an intellectualist, but also uh, independent of Thomas's larger 
doctrine of, of glory in the beatific vision. The basic um, starting point of exitus and reditus, that, that man as being created from God, you know, uh, exits him, is an exit, but then through the beatific vision, uh, we have uh, a reditus, a return into the very being of God so that we participate in the essence of God. These are not just uh, satellite thoughts, uh, to- and, and, and that's not just us saying this. Somebody might respond and say, well, you're, you're trying just to import this rationalistic enlightenment worldview idea that Van Til likes onto Thomas Aquinas. Well, Thomas presents this as a system himself. Now, it's not to say that, that um, he's consistent everywhere, and neither is it to say that Thomas um, has nothing to, good to say. There are a lot of things that are re- really useful for developing an orthodox Catholic doctrine of God, for example. And even the theological proofs uh, are good and sound uh, on, on, you know, as they stand for an enlightened and, and a regenerate mind. <laughs> but the problem uh, goes much further when we start to incorporate the specific Reformed doctrine of anthropology, the fall into sin, man's constitution, all those sorts of things. So, Number one, people need to listen to the lectures uh, that, that Lane is presenting, which lay out this whole landscape in detail. But Lane, I, I mean, w- w- for the people listening right now that aren't going to get the full case because they're only going to get a segment here of this lecture to come, but what what would you say are some of the, if not the most important thing to remember uh, regarding Thomas's intellectualism and where that diverges from the Reformed view? We're not speaking of Van Til at this point, just basic Calvin, you know, Calvin on the natural knowledge of God. What is the big difference that many people who are are cozying up to Thomas, that what are they forgetting? Now, let me let me start with what most listeners would know and then move to what might not be as well known. First, uh, Thomas and traditional uh, Roman Catholic theologians uh, deny that original righteousness and original holiness are concreated and natural to Adam as the image of God. For traditional, for the nature grace scheme that Thomas expounds, Bellarmine expounds, um, the Council of Trent enshrining Thomas's theology uh, expounds, there is um, there is a, a, a supernatural addition of righteousness and holiness that comes to Adam, who is like God in that he has an intellect and a will, but he does not have original, concreated righteousness and holiness. Mm-hmm. That is to say, it's not native to him. It's not built into him as an image bearer, but it's super added. It's given in addition, supernaturally, righteousness and holiness. Calvin uh, and uh, and the Westminster Shorter Catechism 10 says that the image of God consists, among other things, in original righteousness and holiness that are concreated and natural to Adam. They're not supernaturally added to him after he is created without them no. as the image of God. He's made that way. That's just a simple yeah. way to say it. <laughs> He's Yeah. It comes, righteousness <laughs> and holiness come with the creational package. And knowledge too. Yeah. Well, here's yeah, what I'm going comes. to say. Yeah. In, in addition to that, uh, the difference between uh, Calvin and and Van Til on the one side and Thomas and the traditional Roman Catholic theology on the other side is that as goes righteousness and holiness, so goes knowledge. For, so for Calvin and for Shorter Catechism 10, when we talk about what the image of God is by virtue of the creational endowment of the image of God, it consists not only in true righteousness and holiness, but knowledge of God. Knowledge of God is concreated and gifted and given to Adam as a creature. He knows God from the outset of his creation, and that knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, that's the internal ground for for what Voss calls the deeper Protestant conception that man is created in natural religious fellowship with God. Why? Because naturally, by nature, he knows God. 
Naturally, by nature, he is righteous. Naturally, by nature, he is holy. And so the natural knowledge of God it is gifted in the act of image endowment and inalienable to that image endowment. And so you don't uh, begin with anything other than concreated natural knowledge of God that expresses itself in natural religious fellowship. That's the reformed view. That's what Calvin. Concreated uh, knowledge. Concreated fellowship. Natural knowledge, yep. natural, natural religious knowledge, fellowship. Natural fellowship. What we're going to see is only the reformed view expressed by Calvin and fully embraced by Van Til and everyone in the post Reformation reformed uh, wow. dogmatic orthodox tradition should Bob maintain. And on this too. Should yeah. maintain those two things at every point. Natural yeah. knowledge of God. Man, as created in the image, has a natural knowledge of God and also a positive religious fellowship w- with God as he was yeah. created. Now, Thomas yeah, they, um, doesn't have both of those things. No, uh, t- Thomas uh, taught that there is no concreated natural knowledge of God. And he taught as a corollary that there is a uh, there is no concreated religious fellowship with God. There is a likeness to God in that Adam is given reason and will and can come to know God. But Thomas has a very different view from from Calvin. He, if Calvin and the traditional Reformed say that natural knowledge of God is concreated, natural religious fellowship with God is concreated as a gift, Thomas has a different view. Thomas taught that while there is no concreated natural knowledge of God, uh, in his commentary on Romans, pages 59 through 61, which we treat in the course, he taught that there is an inner light by which, through reason, creatures can come to the natural knowledge of God through a reasoning process, through an inferential process. And here's the way it works. Um, He says that the inner light of reason is given the capacity or the potential to attain the knowledge of God as that reason, A, begins with natural, sensible objects. And from those natural, sensible objects, beginning with them, Thomas says natural reason, the inner light of reason, traces back from natural, sensible objects to a supernatural cause for those objects. And and in his commentary on Romans, he says there are three ways this is done, causality, excellence, and negation. I'll just give you a quick illustration. He says that the inner light of reason begins with sensible objects, not with the knowledge of God, begins with the knowledge of sensible objects. And then he says, these are, quote, subject to change and decay, and it is therefore necessary to trace them back to some unchangeable and unfailing principle. In this way, it can be shown that God exists. That's his commentary, page 60. Now, note that Thomas begins with sensible creatures subject to decay and change, and then argues it is necessary to trace back from those sensible creatures through an inferential process to an unchanging and unfailing first cause that is supernatural. That is how knowledge of God is attained. Knowledge of God, natural knowledge of God for Thomas is not gifted as concreated. It is rather attained through the proper inferential function of the inner light of reason, moving from sensible objects and tracing back to a supernatural first cause, namely God. So you could think of it this way. For Calvin, uh, Van Til, Bavink, Voss, the Reformed tradition, that knowledge of God that is concreated for Thomas, knowledge of God is suspended on an inferential process that mm-hmm. traces from sensible creatures back to God. And so there is no um, directly concreated natural religious 
fellowship. There is no concreated natural knowledge of God. The knowledge of God for Thomas, and doesn't this tell you a lot about traditional Roman Catholic theology, is not a gift given to Adam in the garden, but a work attained Mm -hmm. by Adam. That's the difference. And, And so you have right there already fundamental differences between Calvin and Thomas. To put it the way I put it in the lecture for Calvin, Van Til, and the Reformed tradition, you have both a concreated capacity to know God and concreated knowledge of God, knowledge of God gifted in natural religious fellowship to Adam. For Thomas, you don't have concreated natural knowledge. You only have the capacity concreated capacity of reason as an inner light to come to the knowledge of God at the end of an inferential process of reasoning. And once you see that, you recognize that there are two differing and incompatible conceptions of the natural knowledge of God and the way God reveals himself through nature to Adam. And once you grasp that difference, you start to see that there are going to be, and and we developed this more in the lecture and in the course, you're going to see that there are two distinct and contrasting views of natural reason, natural knowledge of God, natural theology, and uh, it, it hinges, by and large, on the question of whether natural knowledge of God is a work attained, traditional Thomistic view, or a gift given, the Calvinistic and confessional view. Sure. There's an awful lot more to be said, and there's a lot more said in the course. Um, But also Lane develops uh, Voss's own thinking on this. Voss's notion of the deeper Protestant conception, as was previously mentioned, is so critical here. The fact that that, uh, Adam is existing as created in, in positive religious fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. Another point of distinction, how Voss develops that, a point of distinction with other theologians, Thomas, Bart, Lane, Lane lists the, uh, the, uh, the whole landscape out and situates uh, Calvin, Van Til, Voss, and others uh, amidst the different figures uh, in this field. It's very, very helpful, very, very useful. But to develop any notion of, of natural theology without laying forth these basic presuppositions and basic theological principles uh, is is not going to lead in a, in a good or accurate direction. And neither is developing uh, Voss's conception of natural theology, even if it was developed earlier in his academic career, developing them independently from perhaps the other theological points that he developed in his uh, theological works, his Reformed dogmatics. It has to be taken as as a whole and an understanding, everything there. And to elaborate this, Camden, um, when Thomas talks about this inferential process of coming to know God through sensible objects, that's the natural knowledge of God. But Thomas says that through the infusion of grace, through the donum super additum, Adam's intellect is ontologically reproportioned to attain a direct apprehension of and direct participation in the essence of God. So that grace, as it ontologically reproportions the intellect, you move beyond that indirect, inferential, con-natural knowledge of God to a direct participation in and apprehension of the essence uh, through the infusion of grace through the donum super additum. And uh, I just want our listeners to be aware of this, um, uh, whether it is um, Darius Pisano's The uh, Glory of God's Grace or Hooter's uh, Bound for Beatitude. The, the, The whole structure of Thomas's view of natural reason is that it must be ontologically reproportioned by deifying grace to directly apprehend and participate in the essence of God. And I love this. I, I hint at this in the lecture, and I'll talk a little bit about more, a uh, little bit more about it in the next module. Bavink, in his Reformed Dogmatics, calls 
Thomas's view of beatitude, the traditional Thomistic view of beatitude, this ontological reproportioning of the intellect to participate in and directly see the essence of God, he calls that a melting union yeah. of the creator and the creature, right. um, an ontological fusion or substantial union that compromises the distinction of the creator-creature relation. And this is where Voss is so helpful. Voss says, rather than thinking of beatitude as an, as an ontological elevation above your creaturely potential as natural, Voss and Bavink and the Westminster Standards, until they say instead you should think of beatitude as the full eschatological realization of all that was concreated in Adam through the sovereign power of God's spirit at yeah. work in the creature. And so the um and and so the relation to God is not an ascending participation in the essence, as Thomas says an ascending fellowship with Trinitarian persons in covenantal communion. And that difference, see, when you put it, when you get that widest angle lens on it, you can see that not only does Thomas deny concreated natural knowledge, but he denies it so that he can make room for the way grace ontologically reproportions and elevates Adam to see directly that divine essence participate in that divine essence and the reformed whether it's voss who calls that an externalist principle or bovink who calls it a melting union um, th those differences lay bare what you called earlier the architectonic differences yeah. between thomas and calvin and van Til. and these are things that we really need to encourage brothers who are thinking about Thomas and thinking about Calvin and Van Til to, to think these things through and come to clarity on it and uh, move in directions that are amenable to and highlight the value of the Protestant and Reformed doctrine of the image, which Voss called mm -hmm. the deeper Protestant conception. Yeah, just to put a point on it, not that it's necessary to do so, but... Uh... Just for me to uh, reiterate to to our listeners and viewers, uh, Thomas's intellectualism here, his his theology of knowledge, his understanding of man as created, is is coherent with it's complementary, but it's all part of the same system of his theology of grace and his in the beatific vision. This isn't an imposition of a, of some sort of system upon Thomas that doesn't exist. And lest anyone charge uh, these two Vantillians with just, you know, forcing a system on Thomas that that's alien to him, you can you can read Thomas yourself, and he says this much to the to this effect. But also, many leading Thomistic scholars, like uh, like Leg, uh, you, you mentioned Spizzano, yes, uh, Spizzano, yes, uh, many people here as on video, uh, Fine Gold. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you got Feingold on the shelf there, but Lawrence Feingold. But uh, uh, the, these are all leading conservative. I mean, from the from the Catholic perspective, gotcha. relatively conservative um, theologians who are developing this very notion in Thomas. They're they're saying the same thing, except they agree with the system and the the theological presentation. There's a leg. Yeah. And yeah. we've interviewed Dominic Legg, and we've interviewed Lawrence Feingold on the program. We'd love to interview Darius Bizzano someday if we could, um, and talked about this. So you can you can dig this up in the archives if you'd like to listen to these episodes. I think they were in 2018, uh, maybe 17 episodes on on Christ the Center. But with all that being said, uh, please listen. You know, take a look at this course, participate in it. You know, take the course, watch it, watch the lectures slowly, read the book when it comes out. But right now, at this point, I'm going to insert uh, the sixth full lecture uh, from this course uh, covering Van Til's Doctrine of Revelation, in which Lane introduces uh, in a more detailed fashion uh, some of the theology here of Thomas Aquinas. So enjoy. We've looked for a sustained time at Calvin's Doctrine of the Natural Knowledge of God. And the thing that stands out when we consider what Calvin was teaching 
as received by Old Princeton and B.B. Warfield, and then appropriated by Van Til at Old Westminster, was that the knowledge of God, along with righteousness and holiness, are concreated in Adam, given to him at the same time he is created, native to him, inherent in him, constituent features of the image of God. Thomas Aquinas is a theologian in the Roman Catholic tradition who stands out in sharp distinction from Calvin's teaching on this particular matter. What I want us to consider is Thomas Aquinas, particularly from his uh, commentary on the Book of Romans and a brief section in the Summa Contra Gentilis, Thomas Aquinas on the natural knowledge of God and the way his theology of the natural light of reason bears on the acquisition of the natural knowledge of God. Thomas Aquinas taught and was emphatic that there is no concreated natural knowledge of God in Adam as the image of God. He taught that while Adam was like God in that he was given reason and freedom, uh, intellectual and volitional capacity, the knowledge of God was not gifted to him or created in him, and neither was original righteousness or holiness. But Thomas taught this emphatically, that there is a quote-unquote inner light, an inner light of reason. I have natural light on the board. It is a light that is derived from nature, but it is an inner light of reason derived from nature that is intrinsic to Adam as the image of God. And through that inner light, through that inner light of reason, Adam could come to the natural knowledge of God. And so, while Thomas denied the concreated, gifted character of original knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, he did affirm a concreated and gifted inner light of reason that gave Adam the natural capacity to know God. And so this inner light is an intrinsic, rational capacity to attain to the knowledge of God that is available through nature. And Thomas has a very specific, very well-conceived doctrine of the natural knowledge of God. In his commentary on Romans, uh, page 59, he says this, man's knowledge, and we're going to go ahead and, and think about this with reference to Adam as created in the image and likeness of God, isolating his status as image of God, and compare and contrast him to Calvin, who said we must always begin with Adam and understand the integrity with which we were first, with which Adam was created. Here's Thomas. Quote, man's knowledge begins with things connatural to him. That is, things in his created realm of existence, namely, sensible creatures, which are not proportioned to representing the divine essence. Now, in a way similar to the way uh, Calvin taught, Thomas believes that you must begin with knowledge of self and knowledge of sensible objects, but he denies that knowledge of God is coincident with the knowledge of sensible objects, sensible creatures. For him, human knowledge is restricted initially, human knowledge in what we will call nature, unaided by grace, nature, unassisted by grace, nature not yet reproportioned by infused grace, begins with sensible creatures, sensible objects that are not proportioned to the essence of God. So there is a qualitative ontological difference between God and the sensible 
creature, the sensible objects, those objects in Adam's purview for him to examine and reason in terms of. Now, this creates something of a problem that needs a resolution. If sensible creatures are the starting point for this inner light of reason, and those sensible creatures are not proportioned to represent and reveal the essence of God, then how is natural knowledge of God possible? If you, in other words, if you're starting with this inner light of reason, and that inner light of reason is immediately connected to sensible objects, and these sensible objects are not proportioned to the essence of God, there is no direct revelation of God available in nature. Thomas does not affirm direct revelation of God in nature to Adam. He affirms instead this capacity of the inner light of reason that takes as its starting point sensible objects, sensible creatures. So how is it possible for this inner light of reason that begins with sensible objects to attain to the knowledge of God. Thomas says this, and these are all quotations from his commentary on the book of Romans, pages 59 through around 61. He says, man is capable of knowing God from such creatures in three ways. And so instantly he says, not only does man begin with sensible objects, but the knowledge of God is from sensible objects. You begin with sensible objects, and you are and reason, the inner light of reason with Adam, was capable of attaining knowledge of God from them. No direct revelation of God but a mediated revelation of God, an indirect knowledge of God. And he says there are three ways that this happens. He says, first, you know God from causality. Causality. You know God as you begin with sensible objects and reason from them using causality. He says, quote, for since these sensible creatures are subject to change and decay, it is necessary to trace them back. There's the, the quotation I want. Trace them back to some unchangeable and unfailing principle. In this way, it can be shown that God exists. What is the pattern of reasoning? Well, through an inferential process of reasoning, the inner light of reason begins from sensible objects, and how are those sensible objects construed? They are construed in Thomas's language by change and decay. And reason moves from these natural, sensible objects characterized by change and decay to a supernatural cause of those objects who, in contrast, is unchanging as the supernatural cause. To put it differently, reason traverses from natural causes, pardon me, from natural effects, natural effects, sensible objects, to a supernatural cause. From the changing and decaying objects of sensation to an unchanging supernatural cause. So notice this as you think about what Thomas is doing, and please remember the differences between Thomas and Calvin and Warfield and Van Til on this topic. Thomas begins with sensible creatures subject to change and decay. 
and argues it is necessary to trace them back to an unchanging and unfailing first cause, which we call God. Now, this pattern of reasoning makes knowledge of God, if you can see it this way, it makes, it suspends knowledge of God upon an inferential process of reasoning that traces back from sensible objects to God. This connatural end, Thomas says, is the knowledge of God. By this inferential pattern of reasoning, by the inner light of reason, working, beginning with and working from sensible objects, you can reason to the knowledge of God as a supernatural cause. So, Thomas affirms an indirect, inferential, natural knowledge of God rooted in the intrinsic capacity of reason to discover such truths. This is his way of causality. Secondly, he says there's a, there's a second way. The way of excellence or eminence. Way of excellence or eminence. Second, God can be known by way of excellence. For all things are not traced back to the first principle as to a proper and univocal cause, as when man produces man, but to a common and exceeding cause. From this, it is known that God is above all things. Now, note that this knowledge of God, by way of excellence, comes once again from tracing back from sensible objects to God as a supernatural cause. Notice further that the way Thomas reasons here is that the inner light comes to know that God is above all things by way of negating what is imperfect in sensible objects and ascribing to God a corresponding excellence or eminence or greatness. This is the way of excellence. It's reasoning in terms of causality, but it is designed to show that there is no univocal relation, no one-to-one -one correlation between the natural effect of a sensible object and the supernatural cause. They belong to distinct orders of being. God is uncaused. The creature is caused. The creature is changing and decaying. God is unchanging. And therefore, there is a categorical fundamental difference between the two in terms of their being. This is the connatural end of natural knowledge. Third, and these really do, two and three really do qualify one another, the way of negation. This is a compressed summary of what Thomas Elsewhere calls the five proofs. This is his exegetical approach where he reduces it to three. He says, third, God can be known by way of negation. For if God is a cause exceeding his effects, nothing in creatures can belong to him. And in this way, we say that God is unchangeable and infinite, and we use other negative expressions to describe him. So, for instance, if the effect changes, you negate change and say God is unchanged. If the effect is finite, you negate finite and say God is infinite, has no limitations. If you say the creature... The sensible object is composite, made of parts. You say that God transcends that and is non-composite, not made of parts, not made of additional properties. If God as a supernatural cause exceeds his mutable and composite effects, then he is immutable and simple. But here's what you have to appreciate, and this must come clear as you're watching, if you are 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 taking notes here and thinking this through, 
stop and ponder this. Notice that in each proof, Thomas is saying, from this pattern of reasoning, it is known that God exists, and it is known that God is unchanging, simple, etc. The knowledge of God is a work attained by the proper use of the inner light of reason and not a gift given at the alpha point of creation. For Calvin, the natural knowledge of God is a gift given at the very inception of creaturely existence. For Thomas, it is a work attained as the inner light of reason works properly from sensible objects and traces them back to a supernatural cause. For Calvin, natural knowledge is given to all. For Thomas, it is attained by some. And two positive points need to be made here about Thomas. Um, first, Thomas admirably, admirably uh, and commendably avoids the front door mutualism that infects Schleiermacher, Bart, Dorner, Hartshorn, Pinnock, Frame, Ware, Oliphant, and others. He affirms that God is immutable and simple in his relation to creation. That we should commend as a conclusion. The method is distinct, but the conclusion should be encouraged and confirmed. Second, Thomas affirms that there is a connection between reason and the knowledge of God. Bart and the modernist tradition that follows Bart denies any such connection between the natural light of reason and the knowledge of God. As we'll see later, Bart denies natural knowledge of God as concreated. He also denies there's any capacity in Adam before he was uh, as created. He denies there was a natural capacity to know God at all. And so Thomas affirms both that God is immutable and simple, methodology aside, that conclusion is commendable. Bart also affirms that natural reason can come to know God. And that, we have to say, is commendable. He affirms at least the capacity for knowledge. But to return now to, to Thomas and to move this forward just a little bit, he summarizes his view by saying, God manifests something to man in two ways. He's given us three patterns of reasoning. Now, two ways that God manifests. First, by endowing him with an inner light through which he knows sensible objects. So God manifests himself in the giving of an inner light that can access God through sensible objects. Second, by proposing external signs, namely sensible creatures. So let me summarize this and put it as tersely as possible. The inner light supplies the concreated capacity to know God. Thomas is a capacity innatist. Denies concreated knowledge, but he affirms concreated capacity. Second, the sensible creatures supply the natural effects through which the inner light of reason can trace back to a supernatural cause. God gives the inner light of reason that has the capacity to know God. He gives the sensible creatures from which you can trace back to God as a supernatural cause, so that man's knowledge begins, A, with the capacity to come to know God intrinsic to the inner light of reason, and B, with sensible objects that reason traces back to a supernatural cause. Once that inferential process concludes, 
Thomas says we have come to know God. We know him by the process of reasoning through causality, excellence, and negation. That, be, that knowledge begins with sensible creatures and from it traces back to God. Thomas says, thus God manifested it to them, knowledge, by endowing them with the light from which, a light or from without by presenting visible creatures in which, as in a book, the knowledge of God may be read. Now, let me give you one other quote. It's a fairly lengthy quote. It's from the Summa Contra Gentiles, um, 133, where Thomas says this, For according to its manner of knowing in the present life, the intellect depends on the sense for the origin of knowledge. And so those things that, that do not fall under the senses cannot be grasped by the human intellect except insofar as the knowledge of them is gathered from sensible things. Now, sensible things cannot lead the human intellect to the point of seeing in them the nature of the divine substance. For sensible things are effects that fall short of the power of their cause. Yet, beginning with sensible things, our intellect is led to the point of knowing about God, that he exists, and other such characteristics that must be attributed to, to, to the first principle. There are consequently some intelligible truths about God that are open to human reason, but there are others that absolutely surpass its power. Note that language. The natural intellect, uh, when it's not been reproportioned by grace, just simpliciter, the natural, natural intellect simpliciter, can attain only indirect knowledge of God as it reasons from sensible objects and natural effects to the suprasensible and supernatural first cause, namely God. These truths that God exists as unchanging and as simple are open to human reason, but have not been implanted in human reason, have not been concreated in human reason, have not been revealed to human reason directly. Reason then before the fall has the capacity to discover truths about God if used properly. That he exists, that he is the first cause, that he is perfect, that he surpasses the effects. But these truths are just that. They are the discoveries of discursive reason. Natural knowledge comes as the fruit of reason's work. This is called capacity in atism. And a key point that distinguishes Thomas from Calvin and Van Til turns on the relation of reason to the natural knowledge of God. For Thomas, reason is an inner light that can attain the natural knowledge of God when it is properly applied to sensible objects. But for Thomas, reason does not begin with a concreated knowledge of God. I hope that's obvious now. Reason gains natural knowledge of God, but reason does not begin with natural knowledge of God. But for Calvin and Van Til, God gives a knowledge of himself along with the gift of reason. Reasoning, therefore, begins with concreated knowledge of God. Remember Warfield's summary of Calvin? Knowledge of self knowledge of God, we could add to Thomas, knowledge of sensible objects, all involve one another. Of course, reason can gain additional knowledge of God, but for Calvin, Warfield, Van Til, reason begins with the knowledge of God, gifted by God, that coincides with the first operation of reason qua reason.
Thomas said there's nothing in the intellect but the intellect itself. Calvin spoke of the intellect and man himself enveloped in this natural revelation of God, gifted with the natural knowledge of God. But the question that we need to examine next is how does Thomas speak of knowledge beyond this connatural end? Let me put it this way as we're beginning to transition to speak of something additional. For Thomas, all that reason can give you by virtue of nature is a connatural end of in direct, inferential, natural knowledge of God. But Thomas also believes that by grace, a different mode of knowledge, a different path of knowing God can be opened that takes the knower beyond the natural to the supernatural, above the natural to the supernatural. And that knowledge comes by way not of the natural or connatural end of reason, but to the supernatural end of reason reproportioned to the essence of God, which we will consider as we continue Thomas's view of the natural knowledge of God in relation to what we can call supernatural knowledge of God. All right, so we hope you enjoyed uh, that segment. Um, We just time traveled and skipped right over (laughs) ourselves. We watched it before. Uh, So I hope you enjoyed the insertion there of that that full lecture. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 25 minutes long. So um, there's a lot there. And that is the first of a three-part series within the course where Lane is addressing Thomas Aquinas in multiple stages. And then Carl Barth, and then laying out the landscape of Thomas, Barth, and Van Til. The reason for doing that is because Van Til often is presented as someone who misinterprets and misrepresents both Thomas and Barth. So the question is whether that's, uh, whether that's a fair assessment of what Van Til is doing. Um, short answer, we don't believe it is. So uh, take a look at the course, uh, Van Til's Doctrine of Revelation. It's the third course in our series, Fellowship and Reformed Apologetics. Uh, If it's not available right now when you're listening, it will be available very soon at reformedforum.org. It will be available for free, on demand, and eventually not only with English subtitles, but also with Spanish and simplified Chinese and potentially many more languages to come. But this isn't a standalone course. You certainly can jump in and follow along if you're able to keep up, but uh, we encourage you to start uh, early on in the whole series and start working through us with this compelling, constantly unfolding and building case to develop and present what we are taking from Voss as the deeper Protestant conception. And when we see that, we see that all of these aspects of theology are all reinforcing and moving towards the same goal, which is heightened eschatological union and communion with the triune God in glory, which is the original goal from the very beginning of God creating Adam and placing him in the garden. He had that promise of heightened, consummate life in the highest heavens. And that's what all of the work, all the theology, everything we're trying to develop here at Reform Forum, whether it's in biblical studies, church history, systematic theology, apologetics, practical theology, and whatever level it is, anywhere from postdocs all the way down to children, everything we're doing is designed to reinforce and promote promote that one goal, to, to reinforce and promote that understanding of that first eschatological promise, first offered in the covenant of works, forfeited by Adam, but then offered to us through the covenant of grace, and given to us and secured by our Savior for us in that covenant of grace. That's what we're seeking to do. That's what we think it means to be mature in Christ, to understand that and to strive for that, not just in, in thought, but in word and deed as well. So if you're excited about that, once again, check us out online, engage in our resources. You can hit us up, uh, comment at mail at reformedforum.org. You can donate at reformedforum.org slash donate, and all of our donors will receive an invitation to come join us in our private chat server, uh, which is much more than text. We can also have uh, video chats and other things going on there, and it's a, a thriving community. 
So we encourage you to uh, check us out online. We thank you so much for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.